Happy Mother's Day. Uh, my uh, heart this morning is to kind of connect Mother's Day and marriage together as we're in this series on, on marriage. Uh, but I do want to take time today and just speak about a godly mother. Ashley and I are privileged to come from families where we have godly mothers. And uh, we realize that is an honor, and especially in our, in our society today. And we're so blessed to be able to have uh, great examples. And uh, because I just said that, I don't need to give her a card. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day, Mom. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> Second Kings chapter 4, uh, we see a, a godly woman in Scripture. An incredibly prominent woman in the Old Testament, a very fine woman that the Bible describes as a fine, godly mother, a Shunammite woman. 2 Kings chapter 4, beginning in verse 8, it says, One day Elisha went to Shunam, and a well-to-do woman was there. Pause right here. The well-to-do wording in the original language It's actually the wording great. Everybody say great. The Bible says that there's this woman and she's a a great woman. In verse 8, she's great. This word in in the Hebrew language is often used in the Old Testament to describe the greatness of God, that God is wonderful, that he's magnificent, that he is great. The Bible says there's this well-to-do, this great woman that The story is going to elaborate on, and we're going to look at it this morning. And you read a lot at the beginning about her family, and we'll start by talking about the family, and then we'll conclude by talking about specifically this woman, and what can we learn from this woman? Why would the Bible, though she's not named, describe her as someone that is incredibly great? Now, in verse 8, it it describes her family. She has an incredible family. She's got a great family. It says in 2 Kings verse 4, the second portion of verse 8, that this well-to-do woman was there who urged the prophet to stay for a meal. So whenever he came by, he would stop to eat there. Now the Bible says that Elijah, who is a prophet of God, used to come by this particular woman's home, this family. And he would share a meal with the family. He didn't just pass by, but he would stop and he would frequent this woman's home. This woman's home was welcoming. It was a place that was kind and compassionate. And she ministered to this prophet as he would travel to and from the area. And she would open her home and he would sit down and share a meal. He accepted her kindness And they developed, to some degree, this close bond, this friendship. This woman is a great woman because she had this great quality of being hospitable. She would open up her home, and this man would stop by. She would leave her home open, in essence, that at any point in time as he was passing through the area, which was quite often, he would stop and have a meal. He would sit down and eat with the family. Now, we know that this woman is not just a woman that is great because of the quality of of her family environment, that her home was a place that felt like home to this prophet as he would travel. But we see the Bible specifically focuses here that she's a godly woman. Look at what it says in verses 9 through 10. She says to her husband, I know. Now pause right here. She says, now I perceive. That's the word. She says, now I perceive or now I discern. That this man who often comes and spends time with our family, he would, he would come and he would go and eat meals together. This woman had great perception. She was someone that was able to discern. What does this mean? It, it means she's a woman that has the ability to see what other people don't see. She would invite this man into the home. This man would eat with the family, but there was a perception, there was a knowing, there was a discernment. She had the ability to see that this man was not like every other man. This man was a man of God. And she says to her husband one day, she says, let's make a small room on the roof of the house and put a bed in it, put a table and a chair and a lamp for him. Then he can just stay whenever he comes to us. 
This woman's a godly woman. She puts her money where her mouth is. I mean, she understands that this prophet is frequently passing by and she's like, you know what? Let's move beyond welcoming. I perceive he's a man of God. Let's go to the next level. Let's build an apartment on the top of our house with a separate entrance. It would have a staircase on the outside or a ladder in those days to get to the second floor of the house. Let's build him a living quarter or a profit chamber and add the decor so that he could stay with us when he's passing through town. Now, could you imagine today, you're sitting down at lunch, guys, and your wife's like, hey, I got an idea, honey. What do you think about dropping 25 grand and adding an extra bedroom or adding an apartment on the side of our house so that a traveling minister can come and stay? I mean, this isn't just the everyday lady, amen, right? She, she's a hospitable person, but to go to the degree that she's now convincing her husband that, you know what, we're going to build an addition onto our house as a way that we can bless this minister and in turn be a blessing to the Lord. There are people in our church that have done very similar things. You probably don't know this, but many times when we have guest speakers, almost every time we have a guest speaker, there is a beautiful home that they have the ability to stay in. And it's a blessing to our ministers. Many of them travel all over the place all of the time. And as they come to access, it is very common for them to say that we provide the best living arrangements out of any ministry that they're part of. And many of them are much larger. But it's because there are people in our congregation that have the gift of hospitality. There are people in our congregation that are not just willing to open their home, but they're actually willing to renovate or build a place that a person can come and minister here, and it's an incredible blessing. Now, hospitality is is a characteristic. It's deeply rooted in the character of God. You say, well, where do you see that? Well, Genesis. God creates this paradise. He creates this place that is absolutely beautiful, and he places Adam and Eve in a garden. It's God's hospitality on full display. You see this principle all through the Old Testament where eventually he'll, he'll command Israel to welcome strangers and share a meal. You see Jesus in the New Testament who says to his disciples, he says in Matthew 10, 40, the one who welcomes you welcomes me and the one who welcomes me welcomes him who sent me. And then he added that a gracious host would receive a reward. Look at what it says in Matthew 10, 41. Anyone who welcomes a prophet because he is a prophet, will receive a prophet's reward. This kind of stuff is actually in the Bible. And so we need to see the significance and the godliness of the ministry of hospitality. This woman is a a godly woman. She has a godly family. And we see how quickly the initiative that she took to honor this man of God as an extension of honoring God turned their family into an incredibly joyous family. Look at what it says in 2 Kings verse 13. So Elisha's at the house one day and he says to his servant, he says, tell her you've gone through all of this trouble. Now what can be done for you? Can we speak on your behalf to the king or the commander of the army? So this prophet carried with him some degree of influence. Many scholars believe there was some type of pending, maybe legal case or something that she could have very easily used the prophet's influence with the commander or the king, but the Bible doesn't necessarily say what. But the prophet is so overwhelmed, he's so appreciative that he treats this woman's care for him as a big deal. He doesn't have this attitude like, well, I'm the man of God and people should care for me. You know, that's one of the big characteristics that I look for in people that we partner with in ministry. Because I've seen many, unfortunately, many people that are in ministry that feel entitled, like the people are to serve the leader. And so when I travel and I go to missions trips and I meet pastors and people that we're potentially working for, one of the things that we really look for is it, a, is it a leader that loves the people? Is it a leader that's serving the people? Or is it someone that has almost like this kingly throne that they sit on and the people are to serve the leader? See, this man of God was very different. He had Christ's attitude, right? 
and he didn't feel entitled, but he was genuinely appreciative of what this woman had and was continuing to do for him. I mean, she's providing all of these meals. They build this quarter, you know, this place on the top of the home. And he says, as an extension of God's blessing, he's like, ask her, what can I do for you? Like, what's something very significant that I could do to be a blessing in return? Now, there's this shocking response that we see in verse 13 But honestly, it's not really a shocking response when you realize the godliness of this woman. Look at what it says. In a response to her being posed with this question, she replies, she says, I have a home among my own people. This woman is graciously declining the prophet extension extension of a blessing from God. She's essentially declining and she's saying, I really don't have any special needs. I'm cared for, I'm provided for, I live among my neighbors and my family. And so she settles kind of the issue, the question in her mind. She probably goes off to do whatever duty she has to do. And it's amazing to me that this woman is so thankful for what she already has, that she can respond to a man that's an extension of the blessing of God and saying, you know what, I'm thankful. I have what I need. You know, the Bible says godliness with contentment is great gain. Contentment, I would describe it to you this way, is the state of being completely satisfied with what God has given you. Can we all just take a minute and ask that question? Am I completely satisfied with what God has already given me? It's a hard question. Am I completely satisfied with what God has already given me or would I be a little bit more happy if I had whatever? So this woman's like, I'm good to go. I'm all set. And she's probably recalling and remembering all of the things that she already has. The fact that she has a place to live, the fact that she has food to be able to provide for this prophet, the fact that she has the ability to provide the resources to build this separate quarter. See, in the, on the home, the, this portion really reveals her motive. It shows the purity of, of her, mom, her motives, that she's not honoring the man of God. Now, remember, this is old covenant, right? She's not honoring the man of God as a means to an end. She's not saying, I'm going to do this so that I can get this in return. No, her reward is an extension of just being a blessing to the man of God, which is an extension of being a blessing to God. And that was her response. She's content. Now, Elisha is not suffice with that answer. He turns to his assistant. He turns to his servant and he says, there's there's got to be something more. And and the man has a suggestion. So Elisha says, what can be done for her? Gehazi says, she has no son and her husband is old. Now, pause right here in a patriarchal society where this woman and this man lived, it's impossible to overestimate the importance and the value of having a son. They didn't have a son, but in that society, a son represented financial stability for the family. If you didn't have a son, in the eyes of culture, the perception of culture towards a family without a son was something was wrong with you. There was a stigma associated with that. And so she doesn't even have a son, but she never even asks for a son. The servant's like, no, this woman and this man don't have a son and he's getting old. So Elisha's like, you know what? Call call her back in here. Call her. And so she stands at the doorway. And the Bible says in verse 16, about this time, Elisha says, you will hold a son in your arms. So the prophet's like, you know what? About this time in a year, you know, you're going to be holding a son in your arms to which she says, no, my Lord, she objected. Please, man of God, don't mislead your servant. She's like, stop joking. Knock it off. I just wanted to give you a meal. Just wanted to build this. I wanted to be a blessing, but like this is beyond her ability to comprehend. She's like, stop messing with me to say that God is going to do something that only God can do. There's no possible way. Stop messing 
And then you get to verse 17, but the woman became pregnant. Well, and the next year, about the same time, she gave birth to a son, just as Elijah had told her. Wow, (laughs) how quickly things turn around. Nine months later, this woman's carrying the promise. She's carrying a miracle. She's carrying something that was beyond her ability to comprehend. Can you imagine the great joy in this family when now all of a sudden they have a son? God had rewarded this woman with a a beautiful son. Now, I love that the Bible is not absent from the challenging things that we go through as well, because you can be like, praise the Lord, you know? But the family also becomes very quickly a, a needy family. I wish I could say that if you come to Christ and you have a Christian family, you're going to be immune to the difficulties in this life. But Jesus said, in this world, you will have what? Trouble. It is what it is. Now, there are things that you have covenant exemption from, and that's a whole other set of teachings that we can't get into this morning. But in this world, you will have trouble. There is trouble that you will face When you stand for Christ, there is persecution related to the sake of the gospel. If you're a person of principle and truth in a world that is unprincipled and what is true for me is not necessarily true for you, in this world, you're going to have trouble working with people. Amen? And so things come in life and, and, and there are unexpected things that happen. Now, you need to pause here and remember that this is old covenant. This is old covenant. This is a lesser covenant built upon lesser promises. In the new covenant, God is our protector. God is our healer. God is our provider. In the new covenant, every one of us is filled. As a Christian, we're filled with the Holy Spirit. But this woman walked through a situation or a circumstance that she didn't have the perfect church answer for. There are things you go through at work. There are things you go through at school. There are things that happen in your family. Things break down. And I've heard people say it, you know, when it rains, it pours, right? It's like, man, you just feel like you're fixing one thing and then you got another thing to fix and one problem here and another problem there. And you're just kind of going through the unexpected things that come our way in life. Is it just me or is it, does it happen to you as well? We're going to be real, right? And so with this woman, all of a sudden they go from, you know, she's got this great godly family. She's a godly woman. God has blessed her with a son. And then all of a sudden, tragedy comes. And it's the sucker punch of life. She didn't expect it, but now death comes knocking at the door of her house. Some years later, The Bible says the child suffered a violent headache while he's out playing in the field where the father's working. All of a sudden, something happens. He's got this violent headache, and the father puts the child in the arms of a servant, and he says, carry the child home to his mother. Have you been there, guys? (laughs) I'm not feeling good. Go find mom. She'll help you out, right? If you need a ride to the hospital... No, but like, it's all the way back in the Bible. What do you do? I don't know. Go find your mother. So you see, he's like, you know what? Kids like excruciating pain, reaping in the fields. The father's working in the fields. The kid's got this excruciating headache. The dad's like, yep, here's servant. Here's the child. Take him home to mom. She'll get some ibuprofen, some NyQuil, and whatever you got. And yet as the mother's tenderly holding the child in her arms, he dies around noon. Tragedy of tragedy, heartache of heartache. There is probably nothing more excruciating in the life of a parent than the death of a child. Having to do funerals for families that lose a child is one of the most difficult things as a minister because you don't have the answer. When I first started in ministry, I remember Pastor Grable asking me to go to do a funeral with him. And he said, I just want you to watch what I do. So we walked into a room and there was a coffin about this big. 
And I remember him saying, I don't have the perfect answer for what you're going through. But I do know that God is still good, even in the midst of the difficulties of life. So tragedy strikes this family. And how people react when the tragedies of life come, how they respond to the difficulties that we face, show a great deal about the character of who we personally are. I mean, you can say all of the right things in church, you can say all the right things in Bible study, but where the rubber meets the road is how does a Christian respond when you face difficulties, when you face heartache, when you face pain. That's where the real you comes to the surface. Amen? So this woman is, is in a very difficult situation. And so what do you do when trouble comes? You know, I've seen many times in ministry that what happens when difficulties come or tragedy comes, it can draw you closer to your family and closer to the Lord, and it does for many people. But I've also seen where people become disconnected in their family. Their family becomes disheveled, and instead of running to God and running to the church, they try to figure it out on their own. When the answer to the very thing that they need is drawing strength from your family and drawing strength from God and being ministered to in the body of Christ. Some people, it's almost like they make a deliberate decision. They feel like something's wrong with them if things aren't going my way 100% of the time. Let me just pause here, and I want to say this very clearly. Church is not to be a trophy case to display perfect people. Church is to be a place that's a hospital for the healing and the cure for hurting people. I refuse for access to be the type of place that people perceive it like it's a trophy case and we have it all together all of the time. That's not real life. You should run to the church when difficulty comes. You should run to the church when you're facing challenges and things like that. Just as Ashley was talking about, you need to because one of the powerful things that takes place in praise, it magnifies the greatness of God and it minimizes the things that you're going through. It's not that you have no clue or you're walking around clueless, but you realize God is great, his presence is with me, and there's nothing that you're going to face in life that he can't carry you through. Amen? And so you should run to church. You should run to the house of God. Now, she's got a dead son. What does this son represent? It represents a promise. It represents a blessing that she didn't even ask for. It represents something that she didn't even think would ever happen. And yet something inside of her, in the midst of the death, in the midst of the loss, in the midst of the hopelessness, she's like, it can't be over. There's just no way. This is a remarkable woman. And when you hear her story, ladies, and and us men as well, you can't elevate her to this place that is so high and so whatever that it's like, man, there's no way I could ever do that. But this woman that's holding this dead son, this woman that's holding this dead promise, this woman that's holding something she really never asked for, but it's an incredible blessing to her family, now it's gone, and she's like, this, there's just no way that this is the end. I heard someone once say that when something supernaturally, or when something is supernatural that is given to you, it is supported by the supernatural faith to sustain it. God gave her this child, and God is going to give her the great faith that is needed and necessary to sustain the gift that came from God. And so she formulates a plan. Number one, in faith, she's going to trust God with all of her heart. To some degree, she conceals the death of his, the son. She takes the child up and she lays the child on the bed of the prophet upstairs. In faith. 
Secondly, in faith, as quickly as she could, she asks, for the, asks the husband for a servant and a donkey so that she could make a quick visit to the man of God, to Elisha. When he asks what's going on, she's evasive in her response. There are many reasons why people speculate that, which is not really important. What's important is she's determined to go see the prophet. Number three, she rushes to the place where he's at. She rushes to Mount Carmel where he lives. She refuses to reveal to Gehazi, the servant, what she wants. And clearly she's resting all of her hope in the man of God. Now, this is the Old Testament where you would work through the man of God to a miracle. We're in the New Testament. We come boldly before the throne of grace, right? We have an advocate. We have the Holy Spirit. This is the lesser covenant, but you can learn from the lesser covenant. But we need to be reminded that we don't go to the prophet. We go right to the father. Amen? Number four, she clings to Elisha. And then this desperate attempt where the servant tries to pull her away, I mean, she is clinging. It's, it's a cultural violation, but she's persistent. She's determined. And she reminds him, she's like, I didn't ask for this child. But in each one of these actions in the story, it demonstrates the woman's determined and persistent faith. What is faith? Faith is a single-minded commitment to fully trust in the Lord. I wish it was easy. But by God's grace, we can get there. These stories are in the Bible to help us, amen? Faith is a single-minded commitment, trusting fully in God. In her trouble, she runs to the man of God. In her trouble, she's running to God. She returns to her spiritual roots. She gets her strength from that place. And when he sees this woman coming, so the Bible says that, that Elisha sees the woman coming from a distance. He knows there's a problem. And he's going to send his servant out to ask her a couple questions. But before we get to these questions and close, I want you to be reminded that faith was her first response. Faith was what? Her first response. May it never be our last resort. God forbid it's anything other than our first response. When trouble comes, when challenges come, when difficulty surfeth, faith is to be our first response. Amen? That's why we pray for the sick. Faith is to be our first response. That's why we trust that God is our provider. Faith is to be our first response. Say, faith is to be my first response. Now, Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who who earnestly seek him. We saw earlier in this story, this woman's benevolence to the prophet or to God was not so that she could get something from him, but make no mistake, God is a rewarder when he sees the purity of our motives. Amen? He's deeply concerned about the motives of our hearts. So I want to end by just asking these questions to the ladies that are in the room and to all of us, but in particular the ladies. <laughs> Elisha sees her coming. He sends Gehazi, and look at what it says in verse 25 through 26. So, so she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. When, she, when he saw her in a distance, the man of God said to his servant, look, there's the Shunammite. Run to meet her. Now, he's not this entitled guy that's sitting back. Most likely, the servant is somebody that's more agile. The servant's more younger. He's able to get there faster. So he's like, you know what? Tuck in your whatever garment you're wearing and get your rear end out there. Run and meet her and ask her these questions. Are you all right? Is your husband all right? Is your child all right? Very practical questions. Everything's all right, she said. It's like, 
is she an idiot? Or is she absolutely convinced deep within her heart that if she can get the word to the man of God, God's going to intervene in this situation? She's fully convinced. (laughs) Everything's all right. It's like, ah, yeah, right. But I want to pause and just ask these questions, ladies. Number one, are you all right? How are you doing? Practically, like how are you doing? Because I know you got married one day to some guy. You realized one day that, you know what? He's got a different personality than me. And Prince Charming today doesn't necessarily feel super Prince Charming tomorrow. I've said over, I know some of you guys are shocked, (laughs) but just go ahead and ask her privately. She'll be honest with you. (laughs) Two people, two different personalities. And man, when you're in love, man, things are smooth sailing, but all of a sudden you're married, you're living together, you're figuring things out, stress comes and all of that kind of stuff. And you're like, whoa, how are you doing? That's why we're talking about marriage in this season. You've got one personality, you've got a set of strengths, you've got a, some issues that you're working through, even on Mother's Day. But you know what? Your husband's got his own personality. He's got his own strengths. He's got some things, and marriage is the process that we continually learn to get acquainted until Jesus comes. How are you doing? I mean, not just his personality. All of a sudden, you got one other personality that's a little personality, and man, they came with a personality, didn't they? <laughs> And then just as you're spinning through the confusion of understanding that personality, a second personality comes. And then a third personality, and then a fourth personality, and you're like, holy smokes. I'm just asking, how are you doing? How are you doing as a person? There are many things that you can't do for your family, but you can't do anything else for your family until you do something for yourself. So I'm asking the question, how are you doing? I'm sure there's a lot of things you're working on at home. I'm sure there's lots of things you're trying to develop in the lives of your kids. But at the end of the day, give Jesus your heart. Maybe you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Christ. Good luck in being a parent. (laughs) Good luck being that perfect spouse. Only through the grace of God. Maybe you're just here today and you're here to be reminded that God loves you, that he cares about you, and that the success of your marriage, the success of your family, the success of your future is hinged upon you giving Jesus your heart and allowing him space to change you. The gospel isn't fix your life and come to Christ. The gospel is come to Christ and he'll begin the transformation of your heart. How are you doing? Now, most of you are Christians. Then I'll just ask you the question, how are you growing? How are you doing? How are you growing? Are you spending time in the Word? Are you spending time in prayer? Are you making church a priority to be here and to value the things that matter most? You know, as a church, my heart is not to have another rear end in a seat My heart is for you to realize that many times the answers to what you're going through is is in the service. It's in discipleship. It's in life groups. It's in relationship. Don't be the type of person that runs when difficulty comes. How are you growing? You're spending time in prayer. You're spending time in, in, in the word. Is the Holy Spirit working in your heart? I love that Ashley is taking time to teach with the ladies on the Holy Spirit. Amen. I've heard it's good, but that was from Ashley. No, I'm just kidding. I know it's good. I know you ladies are being blessed. Turn to Luke chapter one. Just a quick side. There's a great family, an ideal family in Luke chapter one, growing in relationship with the Holy Spirit, John the Baptist family. Look at what it says in Luke 1, 41. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth, Elizabeth's child leaped within her and Elizabeth 
was filled with the Holy Spirit, a mom filled with the Holy Spirit. Look at what it says in verse 67 in the same chapter. His father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit or filled with the Holy Ghost. Look at what it says in verse 15, speaking of John the Baptist. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He's never to take wine or any fermented drink and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit before he was even born. What a picture of a family. A mom filled with the Holy Spirit, a dad filled with the Holy Spirit, a son that's filled with the Holy Spirit and set apart. How are you doing? Just how are you doing? And maybe you're struggling. That's okay. Acknowledge it. Ask the Holy Spirit to help. Is your husband all right? Question number two. Now, a marriage is a partnership, amen? A marriage takes work. Marriage is actually, it's a miracle. Mark chapter 10 says, two will become one flesh, so they are no longer two, but one. Could you imagine having a kid in hybrid math this week, and you're like, hey, Johnny, what'd you learn in hybrid math? He's like, well, I learned that one plus one equals one. No, Johnny, one plus one equals two. No, she said one plus one equals one. Well, she doesn't know what she's talking about. One plus one is what? In God's eyes, it's one in marriage. See, I almost corrected myself. (laughs) What's the point in saying that? Marriage is a miracle. It's an emotional miracle. It's a spiritual miracle. It's a biological miracle. The intimate and closeness of a marriage cannot Be separated. One plus one equals one. So he's like, how's your husband doing? It's another way of him saying, how are you doing? Because you are one in the same. How are you doing? How's your husband doing? I wish I could say in a wedding ceremony when you're standing before a pastor at church that somehow this automatically happens. But I'll tell you what, it takes a lot of work for one plus one to be one. And so how are you doing? How are you working on your relationship. We're all working on our relationship. How are we loving unconditionally? How are we doing when it comes to being quick to forgive? How are we doing when it comes to be less nitpicky? How are we doing when it comes to serving one another? Guys, I know most of you would die for your wife, right? You're like, oh, I take a bullet for that woman. But you know what? I'm, I'm not going to the grocery store to get that. She can go get it on her own. <laughs> How are you doing? How are we working together? How are we in partnership with one another? How are we expressing and showing affection to one another? Part of me wants to saws all the top of these chairs off. The one thing I didn't think about when we purchased these chairs is if I want to put my arm around Ashley, I'm like touching the ceiling trying to do it. (laughs) Are you being affectionate? Are you kind and compassionate? Guys, how are we doing? Reminds me of a family that moved in next door to a husband and wife. And after a week or so, she says to him, she's like, man, do you see that family across the street? Every morning when he leaves, he gives her a big, passionate kiss. He returns home with roses and a huge hug, and he's just showering her with affection. Darling, why don't you do that? He's like, I don't know who that woman is. Why would I do that? (laughs) How are we doing, guys? Is your husband all right, ladies? Is your child all right? Just doing a checkup. I'm just asking the questions. You know, being a parent is a real responsibility. Being a parent is serious business. I remember when we first had our first child, just, man, there is something that humbles you very quickly as a man when you put a baby in your arms. You're like, oh, snap. The rubber meets the road. It's interesting, in Genesis 5, 
Enoch in the Bible. The Bible says there's a son that's born named Methuselah. And then right after he becomes a father, it says he walks with God. (laughs) You know, that happens real quickly when you start having children. You're like, man, I thought we could just kind of do it with the two of us. But all of a sudden, man, I need the grace of God to figure this journey out. Amen? Amen? And God gives you the grace to figure it out, right? How are you doing? How's the family going? We have responsibilities as a parent. You know, we look at all of the insanity with these idiotic college students in our country right now doing whatever they're doing, protesting all of these schools. You see the insanity of what young people are doing today. What in the world, other than the fact that it's demonic and it's funded by somebody, Many of it just has to do with the fact that they are children that grew up in fatherless homes. They didn't grow up in an environment like I did with a mom and a dad that loved me and valued me and cared for me. And I knew what the sound of this was. (laughs) They were old school. Old school needs to be new school, right? They They don't know what it's like to be disciplined. And so we see it manifest all over our country, right? May that not be true with our homes, amen? How are your children doing? Are they they loved? Are they valued? Are they appreciated? Are they being disciplined? Proverbs 22, start them off on the right way that they should go. And even when they're old, they shouldn't turn from it. Ephesians 4 says, bring them up, bring them up. Bring them up in the instruction of the Lord. Don't push them down. Bring them up, you know? As a parent, you may not be able to leave an inheritance. You may not be able to give them a brand spanking new car to go off to in college. But if you instill within them a genuine love for Jesus and you model that at home, you are making them wealthy in eternity's eyes. And as somebody that's in my 40s now, I'll tell you what I'm not looking for in my parents. I'm not looking for a car. (laughs) I'm not appreciative. I'm thankful. They, you know, the older you get, you start realizing all the small sacrifices at the stores and all the small sacrifices that they did over the years. But you know what? As you mature and you and you get older, those things, they're very significant. But at the end of the day, what matters most is that my parents raised me to know Jesus. And they weren't hypocrites. They didn't say one thing outside the church and do a different thing in the home. I couldn't give any amount of money to replace what I grew up with in the home. It's eternally wealthy in my eyes. So how are, how are you doing? How are we growing? How are we allowing the Holy Spirit? See, this is the story of this woman. She has great faith. And her faith unlocked the door for a miracle that would have never occurred otherwise. The Shunammite woman did not have the example of Jesus. Think about this. She didn't have the example of Jesus. She didn't have the Holy Spirit within her, but she walked by faith in the one true God. How much more intimate with Christ should we be? How much more led by the Holy Spirit should we be? And it all works out in verses 33 through 36. When Elisha reached her house, there was a boy lying dead on the couch. He went in, he shut the door on the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Then he got on the bed and lie on the boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands, and he stretched himself out and the boy's body grew warm. Elisha turned away and walked back and forth in the room and then got on the bed and stretched out on him one more. The boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes and a miracle took place. Elijah summoned Gehazi. He says, call the Shunammite. And he did. And when she came, he said, take your son. And she came in and fell at his feet, bowed to the ground, and she took her son and went out. Now, we could spend plenty of time with a second part to this message, but we're not going to focus on that this morning. The point was the miracle was released and it was connected 
to the woman's faith, which was connected to the purity of her motives. Amen? She had pure, a pure heart before the Lord. Faith was her only response to the tragedy or the situation that we, she was facing. And you couple the purity of her motives and the sincerity of her faith being the first response, and a miracle takes place. What do you believe in God for? It's just the question I want to ask as the worship team comes. You can sing, defeated the grave and all of those things. And yes, Jesus did. He defeated the grave. He provided a way to reconcile us to God. Jesus said to the disciples, he said, it's to your own advantage that I leave. Because if I don't leave, the Holy Spirit can't come. And now in the new covenant, we have the Holy Spirit within us. As a child of God, we're filled with the Holy Spirit. We're empowered by the Holy Spirit. We're led by the Holy Spirit. And I just want to ask you the question, what do you need from the Lord today? Yeah, we asked him to check the purity of our motives, right? We need strong faith. Faith should be our first response. But today you're in the house of the Lord. And God is a good father in heaven. The Bible says that Jesus is actually interceding. He, he knows what you need before you can, even can express it from your mouth. But the Bible says, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be open. So I'm just going to ask all the ladies that are here today, what do you need from the Lord? We'll pray together in a minute. But maybe you're here today and you don't know the Lord. The greatest need that you have in your heart may not be healing in your body. It may not be a job. It may not be a situation and circumstance you're facing. If you don't know the Lord, the greatest need in your life is to surrender your heart to Jesus, to know what it's like to be forgiven, to know what it's like to have peace with God. And maybe you're here today and today's the day you want to surrender your life to Christ. Are you a Christian this morning? I just want to ask you that question. Is there anybody today by just raising a hand, you say, today's the day. I want to receive Christ. I acknowledge that I need Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Are you a Christian today? Do you need the Lord? Is anybody here? You want to surrender your heart to Christ and say, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me. Make me brand new. Change my heart. If not, then I just want to ask you those questions today. How are you doing, ladies? How's your husband or how's your family doing? Is all well with you? my heart today is that as God checks the purity and the sincerity of our motives, he will give us strong faith. Amen? Strong faith to believe him for impossibilities in our lives. Let's stand. I'm going to have all of the ladies stand first before the men. You say, I'm not a mom. If you're a female, just stand. Okay? biologically assigned by birth. It is what it is. All of the women stand. We celebrate women and we celebrate men. Would you just lift your hands to heaven today and just ask the Holy Spirit to fill you afresh today. Just say to the Lord with purity, God, I want to serve you. Just as this woman opened her home, she was hospitable. Just as this woman as a family, encouraged their husband to put their money where their mouth is. They wanted to put Christ first by honoring this particular prophet. Lord, would you check the sincerity of our motives? Would you ask the Spirit of God today, would you fill me with strong faith? Faith. Don't think faith is a force. Think faith is just the simplicity of trusting in Jesus. It's our first response. We run to Christ. We run to the church. We run to him in prayer. We run to him the word. We run to him and ask the spirit of God to search our hearts today.
Father, I thank you for every woman that's here today. Father, I pray for purity of heart. Father, I pray that they would be women that exemplify the characters of this woman, the purity of her motives, the hospitality in her hands, putting you first by providing for this prophet in the Old Testament. And Father, most of all, I pray you would increase our faith. Lord, I pray that our ladies here would be women of strong faith. Lord, that they would run to you, that they would trust you, that they would take your word at face value. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're here. I pray you would minister to every woman that's here today. For all of the mothers, all of the expecting mothers, all of the grandmothers, all the great grandmothers. Father, I thank you for the grace of God that's in their lives. I thank you for the Holy Spirit that is within them. Father, we need your precious Holy Spirit to help us minister to our children. Father, I pray that there would never be a day that they are not led by your spirit. God, give them the ability to discern what's going on in the lives of their kids. Give them the ability to discern what's going on in the lives of their grandkids. God, give them perception. Give them discernment. Help them see beyond what's naturally seen. Help them hear beyond what's naturally heard. Father, give them great perception and discernment. We ask for something supernatural today. Father, as there are children that are struggling with all kinds of things, Father, I thank you that our women here walk in wisdom, walk in perception, walk in discernment, walk into a sensitivity with the Holy Spirit. Lord, if there are things in our homes, if there are things in our lives that grieves the preciousness of your Holy Spirit, bring those things to the surface. Father, we want to honor you in our homes. We want to honor you in our lives. We don't want to take your spirit for granted. Father, give us a desire to want to grow deeper and deeper with you, to walk with you, to talk with you. Thank you, Lord. You've not called one lady that's standing here to a role that it's connected to failure. God, you will give them everything that they need to be successful. Father, we pray for moms that are expecting today. We thank you, Lord, for healthy children that'll come from this church. Thank you, Lord, for miracle children that'll come into this church. Father, I thank you that our church is growing and it's flourishing with many moms that are expecting. Father, we're not anxious about these pregnancies. We run to you. We trust that you're a good father. Thank you, Lord, that you're at work in their lives. Thank you that our kids are not a burden like society would show us. Our children are an incredible blessing from God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I thank you for every one of these precious women that are here today. Father, I pray that they would see themselves as someone favored of the Lord, that they would see themselves as someone that's confident, that they would see themselves as bold and brave, filled with wisdom, filled with faith. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we just pray a very special blessing upon every one of them today. Lord, those that are young, Lord, as they desire to be married, Father, I thank you that you prepare in advance, Lord, the person that will come alongside and serve Jesus with them for the rest of their life. Father, you delight in the details of our lives. Lord, you see what every woman's going through. Lord, you're, you're aware, you know about it. And God, you care for them. And Father, just as an extension of your love and your blessing, Father, I just pray your blessing upon them in every way. In every way, financially, Father, I pray you would bless them. Spiritually, I pray you would bless them. Father, emotionally, I pray you would bless them. Father, physically, I pray you would heal their bodies, that you would give them strong families, strong marriages. And we thank you, Lord, for the help of your precious Holy Spirit. Amen.